Chapter Three, Part F of Greener Than You Think. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Greener Than You Think by Ward Moore. Chapter Three, Part F. Due either to Lafacy's perverse sense of humor, or what is more likely his excessive meanness with money, my collect telegram asking for funds to return from Yuma received the following ridiculous reply: No, no sanguinary wiener, intelligencer, no elemosynary institution, eat cake. The meaning of the last two words escaped me, and it was possible they were added purely to make the requisite ten. At all events, Lafacy's parsimony made a very inconvenient and unpleasant trip back for me, milestoned by my few valuable possessions pawned with suspicious and grasping service station owners. When I left, a map of the downtown district would have resembled the profile of a bowl. Now it was a bottle, with only a narrow neck still clear. The weed had flung itself upon Pasadena and was curving back along Huntington Drive, while to the south the opposing pincer was feeling its way along Soto Street into Boyle Heights. It was only with the greatest difficulty that I passed through the police lines into the doomed district. If I had thought deserted Beverly Boulevard a sad sight only three days before, what can I say about my impression of the city's nerve center in its last hours? Abandoned automobiles stood in the streets at the spot where they had run out of gas, or some minor mechanical failure had halted them. Dead street cars, like big game stopped short by the hunter's bullet, stayed where the failure of electric power caught them. The tall buildings reeked of desertion, as if their emptying had dulled some superficial gloss and made them dim and colorless. But contrast the dying city with a wall of living green, north, west, and south, towering ever higher and preparing to carry out the sentence already passed, and the victim becomes insignificant in the presence of the executioner. I was reminded of the well where Goots died, for here, except on one small side, the grass rose like the inside of a stovepipe to the sky. But I suffered neither the same despair nor the unaccountable elation I had upon that hill, perhaps because the trough was so much bigger, or because the animate thing was not beneath my feet to communicate those feelings directly. There had evidently been some looting, not so much from greed as from the natural impulse of human nature to steal and act lawlessly as soon as police vigilance is relaxed. Here and there stores were opened nakedly to the street, their contents spilled about. But such scenes were surprisingly rare, the hopelessness of transporting stolen or any other possessions acting as a greater deterrent than morality. One way or another, as the saying has it, crime does not pay. Few people were visible, and these were divided sharply into two categories. Those clearly intent upon concluding some business, rushing furiously, papers, briefcases, or articles of worth in their hands, and those obviously without purpose dazed, listless, stumbling against the curbstones as they shambled along, casting furtive glances toward the green glacier in the background. The newspaper office contained only people of the first type. Lafacity had come out of his sanctuary for the first time within memory of anybody on the staff. Still collarless, snuff-box in hand, he napoleonically directed the removal of those valuables without which the newspaper could not continue. He was cool, efficient, seemed to have eyes everywhere and know everything going on in the entire building. He spent neither greetings nor reproaches on me, indeed was not looking in my direction, but somehow sensed my presence through his back, for he said without turning round, Wiener, if you have concluded your unaccountable peregrinations, remove the two files marked E-1925 and E-1926 to Pomona. If you mislay one scrap of paper they contain, the bartering of a thousand wieners being an inadequate equivalent, your miserable substance will be attached to four tractors headed in divergent directions. Don't come back here but attempt for once to palliate the offense of your birth and go interview that Francis female. 
interview her, not yourself. Bring back a story, complete and terse, or commit the first sensible act of your life with any weapon you choose and charge the instrument to the intelligencer. I haven't the slightest idea where Miss Francis is to be found. He took a pinch of snuff, issued orders to four or five other people, and continued calmly, I am not conducting a school of journalism. If I were, I should have a special dunce cap imported solely for your use. The lowest copy boy knows better than to utter such an inanity. You will find the Francis and interview her. I'm busy. Get the hell out of here and handle those files carefully if you value that cadaver you probably think of as the repository of your soul. I am not a drayman, and I resented the menial duty of sliding those heavy file cases down four flights of stairs. But at a time like this, I thought philosophically, a man has duties he cannot shirk. Besides, La Fassacy was old. I could afford to humor him, even if it meant demeaning myself. With one of the cases in back, I sadly regarded the other one occupying most of the front seat. If she had at least given me her name, I would have searched and searched until I found her. This train of thought reminded me of La Fassacy's command to find Miss Francis, and so I concentrated my attention on getting away from the intelligencer office. It was no light labor. The stalled street cars and automobiles presented grave hazards to the unwary. The air smelt of death. And nervously I pressed the accelerator to get away quickly from this tomb. I crossed the dry river bed and made my way slowly to Pomona, delivered the files, and reluctantly began seeking Miss Francis. It was practically impossible to discover any one person among so many scattered and disorganized people, but chance aided my native intelligence and perseverance. Only a day before, she had been involved with an indignant group of the homeless who attributed their misfortunes to her, and overcoming their natural American chivalry toward the weaker sex, had tried to revenge themselves. I was therefore able to locate her, not ten miles from the temporary headquarters of the Daily Intelligencer. Her laboratory was an abandoned chicken house, which must have reminded her constantly of her lost kitchen. She looked almost jaunty as she greeted me, a cobweb from the roof of the decaying shed caught in her hair. I have no profitable secrets to market, Wiener. You're wasting your time with me. I'm not here as a salesman, Miss Francis, I said. The Daily Intelligencer would like to tell its readers how you are getting on with your search for some cure for the grass. You talk as if Cynodon Dactylon were a disease. There is no cure for life but death. Since she was going to be so touchy about the grass, as if it were a personal possession, why, I thought, it's as much mine as hers. I substituted a more diplomatic form of words. Well, I have made an interesting discovery, she conceded grudgingly, and pointed to a row of flower pots, her eyes alighting as she scanned the single blades of grass, perhaps an inch and a half high, growing in each. The sight meant nothing to me, and she must have gathered as much from my expression. Synodon dactylon, she explained, germinated from seeds borne by the inoculated plant. Obviously, the omnivorous capacity has not been transmitted to offspring. This was probably fascinating to her, or a gardener, or botanist, but I couldn't see how it concerned me or the daily intelligencer. It could be a vitamin deficiency, she muttered incomprehensibly, or evasion of the laws regarding compulsory education. These plants indicate the affected grass may propagate its abnormal condition only through the extension of the already changed stolens or rhizomes. It means that only the parent, which is presumably not immortal, is aberrant. The offspring is no different from the weed householders have been cursing ever since the mission fathers enslaved the digger Indians. Why then, I exclaimed, suddenly enlightened, all we have to do is wait until the grass dies. Or until it meets some insuperable object, supplemented Miss Francis. 
My faith in insuperable objects had been somewhat shaken. How long do you think it will be before the grass dies? I asked her. She regarded me gravely, as though I had been a child asking an absurd question. Possibly a thousand years. My enthusiasm was dampened. But after leaving her, I remembered how certain types of people always look for the dark side of things. It costs no more to be an optimist than a pessimist. It is sunshine grows flowers, not clouds. And if Miss Frances chose to think the grass might live a thousand years, I was equally free to think it might die next week. Thus heartened by this bit of homely philosophy, just as valid as any of the stuff entombed in wordy books, I wrote up my interview careful to guide myself by all the stifling strictures and adjurations impressed upon me by the tyrannically narrow-minded editor. If I may anticipate the order of events, it appeared next day in almost recognizable form under the heading, Abnormal Grass to Die Soon, Says Originator. End of chapter 3, part F.